Good morning to everyone. I'm Raymond Paredes from the uh, Higher Education Coordinating Board. I want to thank all of you uh, for coming to this uh, conference on, uh, on a holiday. I understand that uh, there are other things you might be doing, and we appreciate the fact that we've got such a good turnout for this, uh, this uh, discussion about the purposes of higher education in the 21st century. I'll, I'll keep my remarks very brief. All of you know that, uh, that we're going through a period of, uh, we, could, we could call it a paradigm shift, disruptive innovation, uh, re-entrenchment. Uh, uh, there are a lot of different uh, ways we can characterize uh, what's going on in higher education, but I think uh, probably the most important thing to, to bear in mind is clearly uh, higher education is going through some form of, of uh, transition. Now, we're, uh, we're being held uh, in public education, we're being held more accountable in, in a number of ways uh, by our students, by, our, by the parents of our students, by members of the legislature, by the general public. I think it's inevitable that as the costs of higher education increase, we're going to be uh, asked uh, recurrently what uh, is the public, what are students getting for their money, uh, which will bring about some uh, more attention, some uh, more attention to learning outcomes and so forth. Uh, I think uh, clearly we've, we've uh, done a lot of work in areas of uh, retention and persistence. Uh, I think uh, here in Texas, for example, we're beginning to see, and, well, I shouldn't say beginning, we've, we've been seeing for the past uh, decade or so some significant uh, improvement and retention, particularly of those uh, students, low-income students that uh, typically do not fare well in higher education. Um, I'm excited about uh, the, uh, the changes that we're going through. I think it's good for any institution or in any massive cultural institution like higher education to go through these uh, periods of uh, self-examination, introspection, and, uh, and change. Um, we've got uh, some extraordinary people uh, here today, not only the participants, but uh, the speakers, and so uh, uh, let's get the day started. I want to invite my colleague, Judy Sebesta, who is actually responsible for organizing this conference to come up here and get the day uh, started. I look forward to uh, the day's uh, discussions, and uh, I hope I get a chance to talk to uh, many of you during the course of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much for that gracious welcome, Commissioner Paredes. I would like to thank you and Deputy Commissioner David Gardner, without whose vision this symposium would not have been possible. I'd like to also thank Nina Wright, Dr. Van Davis, and Sarah Rondinelli for all of their assistance in organizing this event. As the commissioner mentioned, um, this is a time of great change, and I'm really excited about today, and I really appreciate all of you coming to discuss our topic of the day. I just want to mention that this event is hosted by the Higher Education Policy Institute, and it's generously sponsored by Houston Endowment. And I'm wondering if, is George Granger here today? Could you stand up, Mr. Granger? Would you mind standing up? <laughs> George Granger of the Houston Endowment. Glad to have you here today. I also thought you might be interested to know the attendee who came the furthest to uh, join us here today. And that would, I think, um, and anybody can correct me if you think I'm wrong, Professor Mick Wamersley. Would you stand up for a second? Professor Wamersley, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Professor Wamersley is from Unity College in Maine, and we were very eager to have his perspective at the table today. So thanks for coming all that way, and I bet you're enjoying our warm weather already. I want to take just a few minutes to give some context surrounding this event and do a little housekeeping before I introduce our first panelists. The selection of the term symposium as opposed to, say, meeting or conference was quite deliberate. So let me give you a brief etymology of that word. In ancient Greece, as you can see here, a symposium was actually a drinking party. And I have included a vase painting from the time of a uh, slave administering to an apparently hungover symposiant. <laughs> However, 
<laughs> I'm sure you will be relieved, or depending on your perspective, disappointed, to hear that we are not going to follow this original meaning <laughs> as much as we will go with the more current evolution of that term. Symposium, it's come to be known more as a meeting or a conference for the discussion of a subject. And it's that dialogic aspect of the word that is really crucial for us here today. Our subject is the purposes of higher education in the 21st century. And while we are offering a slate of outstanding experts to talk on the subject today, we also want to encourage and build in opportunities for all of us to discuss it. The goal of this symposium all along has been to create a space for open dialogue, a space to think outside the box, to consider new, perhaps atypical solutions to challenges in higher education. So in addition to the informal conversations that we hope happen between the panels during coffee breaks, at lunch, and after this event, we have carved out time for more formal small group discussions, and these discussions are crucial to the goals of this symposium. As you know, this symposium is one of two that we have planned under the umbrella of framing the future of higher education. Now, we selected this image to, I would say, evoke that umbrella, the frame of a door opening to infinite possibilities. However, I myself also think of this. a good old-fashioned barn raising, a community coming together to frame what, for farming communities, was a crucial aspect of their work and lives. Every contribution by the participants made a difference. One or two people attempting to raise a barn by themselves would have taken weeks, and often they themselves didn't have all the skills necessary to build that barn. But together, the members of the community could build a sturdy, beautiful home for their farm animals and their implements. Our information age, or as Robert Scott, the president of Adelphi University likes to call it, imagination age, is an exciting, challenging time of change in higher education. I'm looking forward today to considering the purposes of higher education and to working together to build the frame of its future. Now, more pragmatically, let me take care of a few housekeeping details before I introduce our wonderful speakers for our first session. Uh, some of you might have already noticed, but restrooms are available on both sides of our salon here. So just over back that way and over there if you need to avail yourself of those. For those of you who stayed in the hotel here at the AT&T Conference Center last night and are leaving after the symposium today, just a reminder that if you've not yet done so, please check out by noon. Um, and you can, so I would say, check out during our coffee break this morning or during our lunch hour, which is before then. Uh, the hotel is actually sold out tonight, so this would be very helpful for our wonderful staff here at the AT&T Conference Center. And of course, please be sure to silence your mobile devices, but feel free to use them, particularly if you would like to extend our discussions into cyberspace by tweeting about this symposium. And if you do tweet directions, or even if you don't, directions are included on the first page of the resource packet that you got with your program when you checked in. I should also mention that we are video, video recording and live streaming this event, um, including the attendee Q&A at the end of each presentation or each session. Uh, so please be sure to use the mic if you do want to participate in the Q&A afterwards that Dr. Davis will hand you so that we can get that uh, as a part of the live stream and the recording as well. Now, we're not going to be doing video or audio recording during our breakout session, and I wanted to be sure and mention that. Um, you will be using workbooks to record your work just, uh, just with, a, um, with a marker, but uh, more details about that will come later on. And then... Perhaps most importantly with my housekeeping, as you know, in order to extend our conversations begun today, I will be writing a white paper on these proceedings. However, except for the speakers who will be here on this stage, I will not be attributing points made today to anyone. So please consider this a risk-free space for open discussions on our subject today. Dr. Mark Schneider, 
is a vice president and an institute fellow at American Institutes for Research. He is also a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and distinguished professor emeritus of political science at the State University of New York, Stony Brook. Dr. Schneider is one of the creators of www.collegemeasures.org, where he serves as president. We also have Dr. Carol Geary Schneider. They are not related, not that I know of, but um, we know <laughs> Dr. Schneider is the president of the Association of American Colleges and Universities, the leading national organization devoted to advancing and strengthening undergraduate liberal education. I'm under the Amer Association of American Colleges and Universities. Make sure I get that right. In 2013, she was the recipient of the NACNU Ernest L. Boyer Award and was honored as one of Diverse Magazine's 25 leading women in higher education. And then for our moderator, I am thrilled that we have Catherine Mangan, an Austin-based senior reporter for the Chronicle of Higher Education. She covers community colleges, professional schools, college completion, and workforce issues, and other higher education news in the Southwest. Ms. Mangan joined the Chronicle in 1986 and worked in Washington covering faculty issues for the Chronicle before moving to Austin as a regional correspondent. Please read their impressive full bios in your program. Without further ado, I will turn the stage over to our first speaker, Dr. Mark Schneider. So uh, I want to thank you all for having me down, to, uh, down here to talk. Um, it's, it's a pleasure. As you know, the Northeast, I live in Washington, D.C., and we've had one giant snowstorm after the other, uh, and it's been freezing cold. This morning, I got up really early uh, and went for a walk, and it was, uh, it was pleasant. <laughs> you know, and I actually stopped at the Starbucks on 24th Street and sat on the patio and had a cup of coffee. Uh, at about 7.30 this morning, and again, it was pleasant. It's not something that we've had much of in, in D.C. Um, so uh, some of you may know uh, of my work since I've been, uh, I've been working with the uh, Texas Higher Ed Coordinating Board on a variety of projects, um, and my take on the purpose of higher education actually is, um, is, is, is narrow. I mean, you know, my personal take on higher education is I love it. You know, I was a university faculty member. I have a I have, you know, all my kids are, my two daughters are, one has an MBA, one has, one's an attorney, they both went to liberal arts schools. Uh, forget about the fact that I have to support both of them, uh, even, even though one's 40 and one's 38. Uh, the, uh, you know, so there's the whole question of what's the value of higher education is really the way I think about it, more than the purpose of higher education. And let me just start with a, let me just start with a cartoon that was just in the, in, in the New Yorker magazine. So you, you, you probably, I don't know if you could read the, 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 capture, the, the, the caption on it, but there are two people sitting, uh, standing in a yummy cream uh, uh, donut shop, and one says, I'm working part-time, but I'm hoping once I finish my master's, they'll up me to full-time. So this is, uh, this is part of the reality of what we're dealing with. What happens to students afterwards? So what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to show you, uh, so that before I do that, um, here's, here's my take on that cartoon, right? Can you self-actualize while living in your mother's basement? So, um, so, so what I'm concerned about, what I'm concerned about is what's the value of higher education? Do, do, do students, can students launch after they finish their degrees? Or are they going to be working in yummy cream, trying to figure out how to get up to full time? How are they going to ever get out of their mom's basements, right? Um, so these are, I mean, so these are very serious issues, uh, and I, I know, I mean, you'll hear another perspective about the, all the value of higher education in other terms, but, uh, and I'm taking a very provocative, very narrow view that you, you cannot self-actualize, you cannot do all these other wonderful things that we expect from higher education if you're living in your mom's basement and you're swamped by debt. So the, the data that I'm going to show today is going to be about the value of higher education in terms of wages with a very particular narrow focus on debt service. Because the, the, for me right now, I'm looking at a lot of debt numbers, and the debt numbers are sort of like an encapsulation of uh, what, what the problems are for students launching and moving out of their mom's basement. So, but before I do that, let me just talk about purpose versus value. Okay, so is it about money or about broader outcomes? Of course it's about broader outcomes, but it's also about money, right? You can't self-actualize if you're bankrupt, if you're living in your mom's basement and you can't drive a car because you can't afford it. 
You know, I mean, there's a lot of concern right now about, about students who fail to launch. A whole generation of students are having problems launching, and that's because they're not making enough money. For me, when we start talking about value, then we have to start worrying about how to measure value. And even if we restrict ourselves to labor market outcomes, the, there's the issue of how to measure the outcomes, the value of, what is, of, of what's going on. And these are not trivial issues. I mean, we've made a lot of progress, for example, on graduation rates. We made a lot of uh, progress on measuring retention. But the fact of the matter is that even those measures are plagued with, uh, um, with, with measurement problems. So how do, we, how do we measure this? Do we talk about institution level or do we talk about program level? All the work I've done in Texas and Florida and Tennessee, uh, Arkansas, Virginia, it's all about the program level because it turns out there's a lot of variation between the, the value that programs are uh, delivering. And you could always roll up to higher levels, but there's so much variation within institutions in terms of outcomes that we really need to build our systems and our thought processes around the program level. You know, so I, 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 don't, think, I don't think in this giant you know, mega terms of oh, liberal arts versus uh, social science versus engineering. I, I do, of course, but, you know, I, but I think ultimately we really need to drill down into, in, into the programs. How are the individual programs uh, uh, delivering value to students? What's the time frame? So um, early in, in, the, in my work with College Measures, we were working with states and we were just doing the first year outcomes. But everybody knows that's a flawed measure. It's not as bad as people will tell you because I'll show you later why it's not that, you know, it's not as flawed as people will tell you it's flawed, but the fact of the matter is that first year earnings are just as, uh, you know, we were able to capture them um, and they gave us a lot of information about fundamental patterns of the value of higher education. But in the state of Texas, you have data going back 10 years. So now we're working with you guys to put out data 10 years, you know, what happens 10 years out? Working with Virginia, working with uh, Tennessee, showing the, the patterns 10 years, uh, 10 years later. And I'll be showing you some of those data uh, uh, other, uh, uh, later. Um, if, if, we, if we don't have data from five and 10 years ago, what do we do? Do we do rolling averages? Of, of, I mean, these are fundamental, um, fundamentally important uh, questions. I know they're in the weeds, but these are fundamentally important questions when we start talking about how to measure anything. If, if we want to do comparisons, how do we compare? Do we do a criterion-based uh, um, comparison? Do we say programs have to hit these levels, institutions have, have to hit these levels? How do we set those levels, right? We set a criterion and we say, are you hitting those, are you hitting those levels? Or do we do norm-based? How are you doing relative to your peer groups? And how do you define the peer groups? These are all, the, again, these are, these are not trivial issues, by the way. Um, individual, individually driven uh, uh, basis. How do I value, um, how do I value your uh, needs? How do I value what you value? Right? I mean, do I set the values? Do I say these are the things that matter? Or do I let students and their families and taxpayers and, and their representatives manipulate the values to say this is more important than that? And this is, I mean, this is not a, this is not a trivial issue. So, by the, so I'm talking about these things, but you know the nation in the, in, in, under the Obama administration is, is struggling with these exact same issues with regard to the rating system that the president has been, has been pushing on. How do you do the ratings? And, and these are some of the issues that we're, uh, that we're talking about in nationwide. Who should assess value? Should the government be doing this? You, right, so you know all the pushback on, on the rating systems. Um, or should others, for example, not-for-profits or for-profit companies, be involved in the business of, um, of, of the ratings? You know, so the US News and World Report has been in this business for a long time. And everybody hates them, but it's a private company. Don't buy the magazine, don't follow it, don't read it, right? Uh, but if it's the government that's in, the, in this business, could I just so ignore the ratings that the federal government's going to put out or the state of Texas might put out or the state of Tennessee? So these are, these are, these are some serious issues. So here, for example, uh, from the work that I've done in, in, uh, in, in different states, here, for example, are the lowest, these are the lowest earnings first year after graduation on the left-hand side and the highest earnings on the... Uh, on your right, sorry, uh, on your left is the lowest earnings state by state. These are the programs with the lowest earnings. On the right hand side, the earnings, uh, the highest uh, first year earnings. So what is what's this distinguishing characteristic? The common theme on the left hand side is that liberal arts have the lowest first year earnings. On the right hand side, engineers are the highest paid graduates in the nation, in every single state, except for fire science, uh, sorry, in Florida. Fire science actually is a pretty good discipline to be in. 
uh, in almost every state, especially I think you know as 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 more fire, fire, uh, fires start, fire fighting, fire fighting, sorry, is a uh, is a very well paid uh, uh, profession. So. So a lot of people look at those data and say, well, you know, you got this wrong. The first year data is not sufficient. It's not the right way of looking at it. Uh, the student who, the philosophy graduate who is a barista in year one is going to be a barrister in year 10. And, you know, the, the, the deep skills that they have are going to pay off 10 years later. Um, and the fact of the matter is that that's, in general, not the case. So here, for example, are the first year wages um, and the 10-year wage is out, okay? The red, the, the, the wages marked in red are the ones that are below the uh, state average. It's all, this is all Texas programs. And uh, 10 years later, the ones marked in red are also the ones that are below the 10-year average. And then if we look to the, the last column, that's the rate of growth between year one and year 10. So what do we see? We see that there of the, of the five lowest ones in uh, in year one, two of them increase uh, above average. And that's uh, biology, uh, which has a spectacular rate of increase of 251%, and marketing, which has 154%, both higher than the, uh, than the statewide average. So these, are, these two start low and end high. This one, in multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary studies, is above average in year one, but has a, 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 an anemic 53% growth rate and ends at 49,000, which is way below average in, in year 10. But in general, you start low, you end low. You start high, you end high. So these are just 10 programs, but we can look at the, the whole panoply of programs. And in general, the pattern is there's a very high correlation between wages in year one and wages in year 10. So the, you know, so we'll see later the philosophy major, uh, if they move from a barista to a barrister, the fact of the matter is they're not well, well high paid, uh, well paid barristers either. Um, okay, so, um, so here's, here's debt servicing, an example of why labor market uh, uh, values, uh, outcomes matter. So as a rule of thumb, this is just a, r a rough rule of thumb, that your, your, um, for your student debt should not exceed your first year earnings. And that translates roughly at, with a, as, as the current rate of 3.9% of student interest rates. That means about 11%, 11% of your income is going to go to servicing, of your gross income, sorry, your gross income is going to go to servicing that debt. So here are a bunch of programs uh, in the state of, um, in the state of, of, of Texas, uh, and the institutions are on the left-hand side. And these, all of these have a very high, uh, I'm sorry, this is a range. I, I will show you later the, the, um, some, some variation. Uh, okay, so these, these, these are ones that have a range. There's like 20 campuses up here, 15 campuses. And you can see that the, the uh, percent of first-year wages go from about 12% to down to 5%. Uh, at the bottom of the list. So there's an enormous range in the first year earnings. So we could see, for example, that the two flagship systems, in fact, in the, at the first year have very high uh, rates of debt service, 11% and 12%. And then at the bottom, Saul Ross University and Texas A&M University, Texarkana, have very low rates of, of debt service um, at, 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 the, uh, at year one, okay? So that, that's a criterion based. You say 11% is the number, we had a bunch above, we had a bunch below. This is norm-based, and actually there's an incredible amount of overlap. So we say, okay, here's the statewide comparison for year one, 10% is the average, right? So now all the ones in red are, are above the statewide average, and actually we could see in year one they're above the state average, and except for Texas A&M at, at the end of 10 years, they're still above the statewide average. So these graduates, on average, from these schools are, uh, are in trouble, if you will, or, or, or below the, the state, uh, actually, they're above the, the, uh, um, the norm. So what about time? This is, the, this is an important issue. So what a difference a decade makes, OK? So what I have here are the uh, programs that all have above 20%. All of them have above 20% of the students, of the graduate students, uh, graduating seniors, their first year debt is above 20% of their gross income, right? This is a giant, this is a giant hit. This is a giant hit. So these students are gonna have a hard time 
uh, making payments, right? These are, these are the people that are going to be living in, the, in their parents' basement. These are the ones that are having problems launching. And you can see that the, this starts at 21% for political science and government, my major, by the way, um, and, and microbiology, sciences, and immunology. Okay, so the question then is, this is year one, what happens 10 years out? So we can see medical and basic sciences, $63,000 debt. In year one, 33%, but 10 years later, 10 years later, they're making 217, on average, $217,000, and they're down to a 4% of their wages are being used to support the, uh, to, to service their debt. So if you look in year one, these students are in trouble, but their growth in income is so high that by year 10, it doesn't, it, it, it essentially doesn't matter. If we look down below, we see anthropology as another example, with 22% in year one, but 10 years out, 10% of their income, is gross income, is being, still being served, uh, used to service their debt. We can look at philosophy, the same thing, right? 23% in year one and 10% uh, in, in, in year 10. So, so in contrast to medical and basic, uh, basic sciences, where the growth in income is so steep that, the, that it's a pretty good investment because 10 years out, you're not paying a lot of money to service your debt. It's a trivial amount. But if you look at philosophy, or you look at anthropology, you can see that 10 years out, you're paying a lot of money for your um, um, to service your debt. And there's uh, counseling psychology is 15% 10 years out. So these are, um, the, these are, I mean, these are some indications that there's a lot of variation um, uh, across programs and that we really need to be concerned about year one, but also about what happens year 10. So the, the next message that I have from all my work is that the institution is the wrong level of analysis. I, men I mentioned this earlier, what we really need to talk about is program level differences. So why is that? So here, for example, is anthropology. So we could look at anthropology. You could see um, a, a range, again, in, if you look at the, the, the next to last column, you could see the range in the, the percentage of first year earnings that are done to support, the, um, uh, to, uh, to support debt, to pay off debt. We could see, for example, Texas Tech, we have 15% in year one, uh, down to 8% uh, in, um, in year 10. But we can see the University of Texas at El Paso, 32% in year one, but in year 10, it's 11%. So, so there's a, we have to look at time differences to see how students are doing. And again, I'm just using debt as an example. A lot of this is being, of course, driven by differences in the wages of students 10, uh, uh, 10 years out. And then, then, then we see at the University of Texas, a Pan American, 7%, they've, they're way below average than the, the state average, both in year uh, one and in year and in year ten. So this is anthropology. So again, you could just see uh, in the selected number of um, of programs, you could just see this really wide range. And this is why I believe that programs are necessary as the building block for for the assessment of value. So here's anthropology versus anthropology versus economics. So the first line you'll note is is a carryover from the state the, from the previous slide, and this is the state average. For, for income, year one wages, year 10 wages, the monthly payment, and then we, this is 19% of wages on average for anthropology graduates, um, and 9% 10 years later. If we look down below, we could see the, um, we could see this compares to economics, where, the, uh, where it's 11% in year, um, year one, and 5% in year 10. So this tells you that you, know, you can compare economics to anthropology, but then you can look inside this chart and you can see the range from like 14% down to 3%. Um, so there's again a lot of range not only between disciplines, but also within programs, across programs. So th th those are, those are um, ratings that I made up, right? These are the things that I'm, looking, um, that I'm looking at to try to drive the analysis of what's the value of higher education. Um, and I mean, it's a, it's a common discussion about student debt and, and how big student debt is and how to service it and whether or not this is going to be a problem for students. So the other possibility is individual ratings. Let students determine what they want and how they want to rank various components. So maybe you, you, your, your family's rich and you don't care about debt. Or maybe 
uh, you care about what the possibilities of graduation are more than anything else, or maybe you care about net price. So these are the kinds of things that you might want to be, you might want to maximize or you might want to create different values for in terms of a rating system rather than one based on what's a statewide average or some uh, criterion based one. So this is something that we did in Texas, uh, College Measures did with the Texas Hiring Coordinate Board is, is compare college TX. Um, and you see on the bottom, these, this, this is not, uh, these are sliders that students can actually choose what they want to maximize in their selection of colleges. So you, you move these sliders and you, you can ac actually start building the kinds of things you care about, the kinds of things that are most important to you in terms of selecting a college or a program. And this is an example that we built for, for, for Texas. Uh, you can imagine this being rebuilt uh, to do something about debt service, for example, right? Um, the, other, the other issue is the role of intermediaries. How do you, how do you get students who are... Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a polite word, you know, so they're 18, 19 years old and they think, I mean, every student goes to a school even with a 10% graduation rate, they think they're going to be the person that graduates. And they don't, and they think they're going to be the one that's getting the best job in the world. And they're, and, and they, they're going to go to school because it's next door or they're going to go to a school because their friends went there. So how do we help put information in the hands of students that help them make more sophisticated decisions and how do they process information? How do we help them understand what the value is and what the likely outcomes are of their choices? Because their choices are consequential. They, they are consequential. So we just built this um, uh, with uh, the College Advising Corps and uh, Advise Texas. Um, and this is a tool that's, on the public, that's in the public domain. We built it uh, to help guidance counselors when they talk to students when they talk to students to help them understand and figure out the kinds of options they have and what the consequences of some of those, uh, some of those choices are. So, so after many years of working on this, uh, this is built, and almost everything I do now is built on five questions. Uh, am I going to get in? What's the selectivity of the school? Am I going to get out? What's the graduation rate? How long is it going to take? What's the time to degree? How much is it going to cost? What's the net price? How much am I going to have to borrow? And what's going to happen at the end of the day? Am I going to get money? Am I going to get a job? Am I going to get paid? So those are the five questions that this is built around. And everything that, I, that I'm working on now is all about those five uh, fundamental questions. So let me just end with uh, a, um, the, the, the question that I think many of us will be faced with, and that is, what's the government role in assessing the value of higher education? So I'm, I'm, I'm involved in this ratings discussion in Washington, D.C., and I'm involved with working with the states in, in, in you know, Texas, Florida, you know, some great states uh, with great data. So what is, the, what is the role? Should we rely on the states to do this? Many states are way, way, way ahead of the federal government, uh, and the federal government is tied up in, as you well know, is tied up in knots uh, over, uh, over so many issues, right? So can we ask the states to take the lead in this? States are major investors in higher education. They're, they have more power through their legislatures and through their rules and regulations than the federal government has in, in so much of what goes on in higher education. Um, and the values in states are, can be radically different than, the, than what's in, involved in the federal government. I think I sort of, uh, you, you have a hint where I come down on the federal government versus states. Uh, but can we allow some leading states like Texas, <coughs> excuse me, to, to, to point the way to the future and states that don't care to do this, do we just leave them behind? I think that's a fundamental issue. And if we, if we think the federal government could do it, uh, what exactly are their powers and what restraints do we need to make sure that the federal government does it right? The last one, the last one I think is really fundamental. And this is the horn of the dilemma that I think we all face. And this is using these kinds of valued data for accountability versus consumer choice. So accountability is, you know, you hit these numbers or we're going to knock you on the head, right? You're going to lose something if you don't hit these numbers. Performance-based budgeting, right, is an example of, you know, hit the numbers or you're in trouble. So the question then is, you know, do we, how do we measure some of these more complicated value issues? Are we ready to start putting labor market outcomes into performance budgeting systems? That, that's, a, that's a serious issue, right? That's a serious issue. So even Tennessee, which has the most 
at least nationwide, is recognized as having one of the advanced uh, uh, performance budgeting systems in the, in the nation where all his money is tied up with performance budgeting. So I work with them. I don't think anybody's quite ready to start putting labor market outcomes into the performance budgeting system. And there are lots of reasons. I showed you some of them, right? So, so do, we want to, do we want to think about these measures of value in accountability systems, or do we want to try to figure out how to help to use these data to help students make better choices, better informed choices. So is it about accountability or is it about, consu about consumer choice? And with that, I'll, I thank you. Well, good morning and uh, thank you for inviting me to join this discussion and to uh, continue this opening framing discussion of the purposes of higher education. Um, the purpose that I think is most profound is signaled by the title of my remarks. So thank you, Judith. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is pick up where Mark has left off with the economic purposes of higher education as far as students is, are concerned, and especially their need for strong, wise guidance about how to make the best use of their time in college and our investment and their investment in college. Uh, but then I'm going to um, expand beyond that because, of course, as I'm sure many of you were sitting there thinking, there are other purposes to higher education besides making money. And I want to talk about a couple of them that I think matter to all of us, matter to our collective future in a global interdependent era. Uh, and then I want to come back very briefly to some of the thoughts I have about changes we can make, uh, not just in the advice we give students, but the things we ask them to do in college that might, in fact, better prepare them for complexity and change and for uh, the economic future they hope to make as well. So I believe a handout went around or is coming around. You all have this. Um, and in your packet, you will find some other things that AACNU has published, um, including a, a a portrait of the, um, how liberal arts and sciences graduates fare in terms of salaries that I think um, makes interesting juxtaposition with some of Mark's findings. Uh, but we can come back to that in the give and take later on. Uh, I give you the handout because I have far more things to cover than I can possibly talk about in a few minutes. And so I wanted you to have some reference points uh, for, to orient you uh, in the conversation. So at various points, I'm going to be talking about um, LEAP, Liberal Education in America's Promise, a big initiative uh, that uh, uh, many institutions in Texas are part of. And I already met people this morning who are using some of its materials. If you know it, uh, you don't need to look at the LEAP at a glance. If you've never heard of it, you might want to look at it. But I also want to start with the whole question of what are frequently confused terms that get in the way of our even talking about the purposes, much less the practices, of higher education. Uh, when Judith introduced me, she mentioned that my association uh, is the leading advocate for advancing and strengthening liberal education. And I'm sure that everyone in the room had different understandings of what that meant. The Chronicle, for example, routinely assumes that we defend liberal arts colleges and only selected disciplines, and this is not true. We are a big tent organization. Our mission is liberal education, not the liberal arts, and I'll clarify the distinctions among them. Uh, but our real focus is on what we call inclusive excellence, trying to make sure that every student who goes to college, wherever he or she starts, wherever he or she finishes, makes the most of that education. So we've spent a lot of time trying to clarify the purposes of education as they apply to our own educational programs and to create ways that we can, in fact, measure whether or not students are leaving college with the kinds of learning that liberal education describes. Just a few distinctions. You've got a guide to frequently confused terms on page three of your handout. Um, liberal arts, uh, often a very confused term. Does it just mean the humanities? In our own salary study, we made it mean the humanities, social sciences, and the arts. But most of us who have an education know that liberal arts has always included the sciences. Our position as an association is that in the various component elements of a great education, every student needs to have a strong foundation in the liberal arts and sciences to make sense of the world around them. But the fact of the matter is that two thirds of all the degrees we give in this country are not in liberal arts and sciences disciplines. They are in professional disciplines, career and technical disciplines. About 9% of students are going for the highest paying field of all, which is engineering, as Mark has already said. 
So we have long since, as an association, insisted that what we're talking about has to apply to everybody, not just to a small pocket of those who are majoring in, in specific fields. But it is our argument um, that the outcomes of a liberal education, specifically the essential learning outcomes that are outlined on page four of your handout, and that many of you have actually used on your campuses, are foundational to student achievement, and I mean career achievement as well as other kinds of achievement, whatever the actual field of specialization. So the two Schneiders come with different notions, the things that absolutely ought to be there in our evaluation systems. Uh, Mark is concerned that we find out what salaries are going to be and what the loan debt is going to be, and I'm certainly not opposed to that. Uh, but we would argue that we need to see whether or not students are actually working on these essential learning outcomes. And a crucial point in my remarks, to succeed in this economy, the outcomes that we have identified with a liberal education are indispensable. They are the key to opportunity and success for all students, whatever their field. Or to put it differently, to succeed in this economy, students are going to need more and more highly engaged liberal learning, not less. And I'm going to start my argument for this uh, with employers themselves and what they have had to say on this subject. The LEAP initiative has been concerned for over a decade to talk and work very closely with employers. And much of what I have come to see about the economy was uh, introduced by small group conversations, meetings like this, where employers and policy leaders came to the table with educational leaders. And we all started talking about this question. What do students need to, uh, to learn to succeed in a 21st century environment and in this a 21st century economy? Subsequently, we began commissioning surveys of employers. We continue to do focus groups. And my next few minutes of remarks are coming from our latest survey, uh, which we released um, in April of this past year. And it is titled, It Takes More Than a Major, Employer Priorities for College Learning and Student Success. So, with the very titling of this report, I do flag one significant difference between uh, Dr. Schneider's remarks and my own. While it's obviously important that students have some notion of what salaries attach to different career options, if we focus them only on what's in their actual major program, we're distracting them from much else that also matters within and beyond their majors to their significant preparation for job success and for life success as well. So um, to set the context for this, one of the things we've learned from all these conversations with employers, and it's documented again in the latest survey, is that they see the bar being raised. They're, they say, we're asking more of people that we hire than we used to. Uh, and the reason for that is that innovation is crucial to our fortunes, whatever, whether it's higher education, and we're here to talk about innovation in higher education, or health, or technology, uh, various kinds of science, whatever you're doing, if you're not innovating, you're falling behind, uh, and, you're, and you're likely to fail, or so employers see it. And therefore, they're looking for people, they want to hire people uh, who can contribute to their ability to keep adapting to a very complex and changing world. They say that they're asking employees to take on more responsibilities and to use a broader, more multidimensional set of skills than in the past. Uh, and strong majorities of employers endorse specifically the outcomes that AACNU has described as the essential learning outcomes, the defining component elements of a 21st century liberal education. So there's various ways I can show you this, but the most efficient way is to pick up your handout and look at page five and compare it with what's on page four. Uh, page four, the LEAP Essential Learning Outcomes. Page five, the percentage of employers who, in the latest survey, when asked whether higher education should spend less, the same, or more emphasis on these outcomes, the percentages that have little diamonds by them say more. Um, and uh, if the uh, item has a little box by it, the questions uh, took the form to employers of, Whatever their major, do you agree, somewhat agree, um, highly agree, et cetera, that um, all students should acquire, and you'll see the very first item on uh, the top of page six or five, is broad knowledge in the liberal arts and sciences. Whether or not they majored in it, employers believe that broad understanding of the disciplines that help us make sense of the world around us, its science, its technology, its social systems, its cultural values, its global interdependence, they think all of this is important for jobs. 
not just for life, not just for democracy, but for jobs. Uh, and you can see on the rest of this page the percentage of employers that uh, are looking for more emphasis on a set of intellectual, practical, personal and social responsibility skills, uh, and the ability to integrate and apply one's learning in new contexts. All of these things that I know you are already working on in your own campuses, this is what employers say they want, whatever the students major. So it's not just a question of how much you might make in a certain field, it's whether or not you're leaving college or community college with a portfolio full of uh, the capacities, experiences, and demonstrated achievements that show that you actually have possessed these uh, capacities and can apply them to some significant issues and problems. A couple of other uh, data points from our survey. Um, uh, employers say, 95% of them say, as I mentioned, that they are putting, uh, when they come down to the final hiring decision, this is the way the question was put, what are the things you look for, the, the final deciding points? Whether or not people have the intellectual and interpersonal skills to help them to contribute to innovation is the top one. But right behind it uh, is the um, assertion that the candidate's capacity to think critically, communicate clearly, solve complex problems is finally going to be more important than what their actual subject of their major was. Not that the major doesn't matter, it does, and I'll show you some of that in a few minutes, but these things are even more important. Um, and another uh, thing I want to call your attention to, 91% of employers say that whatever the students studied, all students should have had experiences in solving problems in college with people whose views are different than their own. And a strong endorsement of the commitment that I know all of you have made to, bring, to engaging diversity on your own campuses, between campus and community. But the other significant word there is problem solving. Not just that you know other people whose views are different from your own or you've been someplace unlike where you grew up, but that you've actually worked with people to get things done. I think there is a longing in our society, in our community, and certainly in Washington, D.C., uh, for higher education to help us develop the capacity to solve problems, to create solutions for our future. Because this is one of the key purposes that society assigns to us and that we need to take seriously. A couple of other uh, employer comments before I shift gears here and shift perspective. These are from focus groups. Employers have over and over again asserted they do not want people who can see things from only one point of view. One of my favorite comments from the uh, focus groups Students who are locked into mental cubicles, one group of Virginia employers said, are going to be left behind. We're changing so fast that if they're stuck in one way of looking at things, one way of doing things, if they can't adapt to where we're going, then they will be left behind. They certainly won't be promoted, uh, and they may not even be retained. Uh, conversely, uh, another focus group, uh, employers picked up the phrase that 360-degree 300 degree perspective. We want people who can look we want a team, not just individuals, who can look at things from every possible angle in order to get things done. Uh, there are some other questions in the latest survey that may be of interest to some of you. How many of you have worked in one way or another with what AAC and U is calling high impact practices? A few. Engaged learning practices, uh, things ranging from first year seminars, writing intensive courses, undergraduate research, uh, internships, and more. Um, in, the, in this particular survey, not using the term high impact practices, of course, but simply describing them as things that many institutions are trying to emphasize, we asked employers which of these would be most useful for success in the economy. So, uh, there are answers on the PowerPoint, but it's also on the back of your uh, handout here. Again, 91% of them uh, diverse, diverse problem solving. But right behind that, 83% would like students to have more experience in undergraduate research. 79% senior projects, 78% internships and other forms of work in the community, and then 74% uh, collaborative research. So practices that are basic to high quality learning, all of your institutions, employers would like to see more of them. They'd like to know more about what students were doing in these and how these things may relate to their preparation for the economy. So, a uh, final question, we've asked this in all four of our surveys, which is more important uh, for recent college graduates? A combination of knowledge in a particular field plus the sort of broad learning I've just been describing, having broad learning only and less emphasis on a major, 
or primary focus on a major. In this survey, only 16% said the major is the thing. 55% uh, breadth plus depth, and interestingly, 29% breadth only. And uh, we also uh, actually asked employers to respond to our definition of liberal education. If you were advising your own child, what would you tell them to do? 74% uh, say I would advise them to, take, to get an education that sounds like the description of education we put in the survey. Uh, when the It Depends was taken away, uh, it actually rose to 89%. My, our argument as an association is that the things we want for our own children are what we should want for everybody's students. Um, it's not just our kids alone. So employers' views, I believe, are reflecting what the longer-term trends in the economy. And uh, on this PowerPoint and also on the back of your uh, handout, you'll see something we borrowed from economists at uh, uh, MIT and Harvard. And they're looking at the extent to which the economy is demanding and giving wage premiums for people who are able to deal with unstructured problems. The downward lines are for people who can do routine skills, uh, routine thinking, things that can be programmed. All of those things are being put on computers and either computerized or outsourced or both. Uh, it's the kinds of capacities or kinds of assignments where we don't yet know the answer that are the future of the economy. And I think that's what's behind all of the employer endorsement of this broad, adaptive, critical thinking uh, that I've just shared with you. But of course, it's not just the economy. Uh, and so I want to spend a couple of minutes on some of the other things we have to take into account as you uh, are thinking about the topic of this uh, symposium and the one that uh, comes after it next summer that will look at practices related to our purposes. I've titled this uh, piece of it, What the Greatest Generation Knew and What We Must Reaffirm. Our conversation about higher education has become so, so truncated. It's as though the metrics we can round up and, and put in charts have become the definers of what we're going to attend to. And this will be so self-defeating for everything that has made American higher education great. So I want to go back to the Truman Commission report, which some of you will know. How many of you are from community colleges? What's the significance of the Truman Commission report in the history of community colleges? It was the big leap forward uh, for community colleges. Uh, six volumes, we used to write more substantial reports in 1940s. Uh, six volumes, but only three principal purposes of higher education, just three. And here's what they were. Education for a fuller realization of democracy in every sphere of life. And that was one of the reasons why they wanted the community colleges to expand and grow. Education directly and explicitly for international understanding and cooperation. And my, and my personal favorite, education for the application of creative imagination and trained intelligence to the solution of social problems and the administration of public affairs. Creative imagination and trained intelligence brought together to help us solve significant problems. Imagine this set of purposes, updated, resituated in the 21st century and applied to our current societal context, a context in which democracy is both desired around the world and at home and beset on every possible front, perhaps most conspicuously in Washington, um, in which global interdependence is now framing, reframing every aspect of work, community, lives, um, and urgent problems that we have to solve of every kind you can fill out the rest of that, that thought. I want to argue that we need to reaffirm and renew our social compact with democracy, and that in an era when ever larger students, uh, numbers of students are going to college, know they have to go to college, we can't settle for what we have now, which is an assumption that some of them will just get narrow job training, and others will get this big picture education that I'm talking about. This is the wrong, wrong for their future, for their economic hopes, and it's wrong for our society. So how do we bring a sense of focus and purpose to students' college learning? How do we help them see while they're in school that they're not just taking courses, they're not just piling up credits, uh, they're not just finding the best bargain for their dollars, but in fact, they are being prepared to bring creative imagination and trained intelligence to the solution of social problems, global problems, and workplace problems as well. And now I'm shifting from, all right, these are our big picture goals for education, this is a society and an economy urgently in need of people who bring those adaptive, 
capacities to problems that need to be solved of every, of every possible kind. How do we think about that? And I want to argue that the digital revolution opens up some new ways that we can think about it, and that it's our responsibility as leaders to seize the moment to create more space for that problem-centered, analytic, investig investigative, and creative work uh, that we need for our society and that the economy needs for its future. So I'm just going to talk about this briefly. Hopefully, I can bring it up some more when we open up the discussion to all of you. I want to argue, and this will be a, a theme, for those of you who have worked at all with LEAP, this will be a theme for LEAP going forward. Uh, we need to think about remapping college study to foreground the cross-disciplinary study of unscripted questions, questions to which we do not know, yet know the answers, uh, but we know they are important and we know they deserve our attention. Contemporary questions, health, education, poverty, illiteracy, sustainability, on and on, but enduring questions too, the ones that the liberal arts have always been about. Justice, decency, community, love, what it means to live a good life. Suppose we were to envision college study as guided preparation for each student to identify and work on what I'm calling now a signature topic, a signature issue, and the relating work across courses uh, and internships and uh, uh, research, various kinds of experiences, questions that matter to the student, that's where you have to start. I, I unveiled this a couple of weeks ago at Montgomery College, which is a community college in, uh, in Maryland, and there were students there, and they said, well, what are you going to do about the students who aren't very interested, you know, who don't want to work on these big questions? And I said, and I think it's crucial, we have to ask them what their questions are. All of our students have questions. They're observing what's going on in the world around them. They're seeing a disconnect between the way they think it should be, whatever that is, and what they actually experience. Start with their questions and lead them to projects uh, that are worth their time and worth their attention. So that every single one of them can expect a direct, extended experience in probing and tackling, in dialogue with others, preferably people whose views are different than their own, unscripted questions of their own choosing. Tying this together through courses, projects, practicums, research, senior activities, and community colleges, many of them have senior capstone courses too. This doesn't just have to be seen as a four-year issue at all. And it's all made more doable by technology. Because many of our students, many of you are already um, putting together with students portfolios that enable them to show themselves, their families, future employers, and you what it is they've been working on and whether or not while working on these problems they were actually developing all these abstract capacities that employers consider so important and we consider important too. So we would think about the first year experiences introducing students wherever they start to the kind of questions that we explore in our disciplines, but also in the higher education enterprise as a whole. And then the subsequent activities would build on that, it would be building students' capacity to grapple with significant questions and problems. The students' own portfolio would show what their own translation had been of that. And over time, not going to happen this summer, but over time, employers would know to look. What is in your portfolio? What were, the, what were your signature projects, your signature concerns? Disciplinary inquiry would still be foundational. This AACNU is not declaring war on disciplinary majors. Far from it. We think that majors allow the deep dive into frames of, uh, of analytic uh, analysis that enable students to actually know the difference between um, something where they have deep grounding for the position they're taking and something where they're just giving you their top of the head opinion. But we also want to argue that for this, this century, this world, of complexity, of global interdependence. It cannot be majors only. We have to find ways of harnessing the multi-dimensional strengths of our institutions for scholarship, but also for learning, so that we don't just have gen ed requirements that students are marching through, but rather those requirements are coming together. They're chosen by students. Their way of filling them out is chosen by students for their ability to help them uh, pursue questions of, that are significant to them and that matter to society. And that, I think, is the key question for this new era of digital innovation. Are we, in fact, going to seize it uh, so that every student has this kind of ac experience, so that we free up all the time and money we are spending on delivering lectures to create more opportunities for students to take the knowledge that they can find in a million more interesting ways at this point, frankly, um, and apply it to problems that really matter. Test their 
analyses, learn from the uh, innovations, and make judgments about what worked and what didn't, guided by others, guided by faculty, guided by peers, guided by community partners. This is the argument I want to make about the purposes of higher education. We are preparing students to create solutions for our future. To do this, we need a new kind of thinking about the component elements of a broad liberal education in career and technical fields, as well as the more traditional arts and sciences. And if we can do this, we can bring new purpose and new focus to college learning, to students' benefit, and societies as well. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just throw out a few questions to you so we can keep the conversation going before we open it up to the audience for questions. And I'll start with, with Mark. Um, a lot of high schools, it seems, are encouraging uh, many minority and, and first generation kids in particular to pursue workforce training certificates that are tied to the needs of the local economy um, as a way to land jobs, you know, decent paying jobs, relatively quickly and cheaply. But I know Carol's Association has raised some concerns that that kind of tracking could lead to a two-tiered system where only some students um, have access to the kind of broad liberal education she's talking about and others, a more narrow technical uh, field. And I, I just wondered if that's a legitimate concern. Is, is that an unintended consequence of focusing so much on the immediate return on investment? I think, I think that's a fair question. And, and uh, I think we all struggle with this issue, the degree to which uh, our higher education system is stratified and, uh, and whether or not it's channeling certain uh, classes of students into different, uh, uh, different tracks. And I, I recognize that concern, but I also recognize the concern that students, uh, again, need jobs and they, are, and they need uh, wages and they need, um, and sometimes they either don't want to or don't have the time or the inclination to do long courses of study. So we know that the fastest growing degrees, right now the bachelor's degree is the, the most common degree granted in the United States. That it is the degree when people talk about a college education, that's the degree that most people think about. But the fact of the matter is that the fastest growing degrees are, are, are associate degrees and actually uh, sub-baccalaureate degrees. The number of certificates being granted in the country is increasing faster than any other kind of certificate in, in, in the nation. Some, now, some of those certificates are obviously going to people who have bachelor's degrees and are, are uh, you know, going back to get certified to have a skill that their employer or that the society uh, needs. Um, and some of these certificates, again, you know, we, our data on certificates is, I mean, it's really, um, so I, I was the commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics, and, and um, so it's five years ago, so I think the statute of limitations has passed, so I don't have to apologize for, uh, for, the, for iPads, for example, anymore. But the, but, the fact, but the fact of the matter is that we, I mean, we're struggling now, the nation is struggling on how better to classify track and understand certificates. It's, again, it, I mean, the growth rate on, of, of certificates is, is, is enormous. And, the, and, and we track them in Texas, in Florida, in Tennessee. Some of these certificates uh, pay large amounts of money, right? So I, I understand, and I, and I, you know, again, I, I have a liberal arts degree. My daughters have a liberal arts degree. All my friends have liberal arts degrees. I got it. I got it. Look around the room. You know, everybody here has a PhD, right? Um, or most people have PhDs. I got it. But the fact of the matter is that we live in a very rarefied society, and, um, but most of our students don't, right? I mean, what we need to worry about, again, this may be a very narrow focus, and, and I apologize for a very narrow focus, but I want students to have skills that they can get jobs with at the end of the day. I want them to be able to make sufficient money so that they can support their families, so that they can move out of the basement of their mom's apartment uh, house, Right, um, and, 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 and I look at some of the numbers, I look at some of the numbers that, I, that I've turned over, you know, uncovered in every state that I've worked in, and these technical degrees are extremely valuable. They're extremely valuable. Community colleges, the best community colleges are ones that are working with local employers, right? And I, got, I understand these surveys where, you know, employers always say the same thing. Right, you know, so halfway down the list, I want students with 21st century skills, I don't know what that means. I've already heard people talk about 22nd century skills, so we gotta be careful about getting stuck in this century as compared to the next one. Uh, you know, they want interpersonal skills, they want this, they want that, and about halfway down the list, everybody says, ah, that's what liberal education's all about, or liberal arts education, so therefore we need liberal arts education, right, because that's what employers want. 
Well, the employers haven't told their hiring managers, look at the numbers that I show you, right? I mean, so there's a disconnect between when you're talking to CEOs who, you know, many of them went to Yale and Harvard and, and did liberal arts and they were fine, you know, I don't care. I mean, quite frankly, you know, if you majored in poetry at Yale, great for you because you're going to figure out how to make a bunch of money or you're going to inherit a bunch of money. But, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that the hiring managers, right, the hiring managers are, are paying premiums for students with not fancy skills, right, but today's problem-solving skills. Carol, what's, if, if I can ask sorry, you, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what's I, wrong I was on my soapbox, sorry. <laughs> what, so what's wrong with steering students um, to where the jobs are, where the local needs are? I believe I said 65% of the degrees we're giving in this country are going to career and technical fields. I, I don't actually know the figures on certi uh, certificates, but um, that's AA degrees and BA degrees are, are going in, in those areas. So I, I'm trying valiantly to get us out of this either or a mindset. I think one of the worst things that the proponents of the liberal arts used, got themselves into was either you prepare for life's big questions and values, or you get ready for a job. Uh, but it is some 30 years since AACNU, as the leading organization uh, concerned with these issues, got, got over that idea. So it's not either or, it's both and. Um, and some of you know I've been involved in the degree qualifications profile. How many of you have looked at that at all? Are vaguely familiar with it? Lumina Foundation uh, has to its credit, recognized that the investment it and other foundations are making in student success, previously defined as completion, has to be guided by some notion of quality. So they brought people together to try to define what component elements should be of a 21st century degree. And those of you who don't like the term liberal education, we have another version of the same thing, uh, the degree qualifications profile. Um, but it, it has something in it that speaks specifically to this uh, way to get us beyond this either or view of the world. Uh, the authors know the data. Um, I worked with several people on this document. We know the data and we know that many students are in fact stopping out, dropping out, coming back as returning adults. They have practical experience. They may have an applied degree or a certificate. The DQP says that one of the five component elements of a 21st century degree at the AA level, and the BA level, and beyond should be applied learning, the kind of thing you might well have learned in your certificate program or on the job or in the military uh, or somewhere other than in a classroom where they're teaching you philosophy. One of the five component elements, uh, but not to the exclusion of the other things because it's also talking about broad and integrative learning, about specialized learning about intellectual skills and civic learning. Those are the five pieces of the DQP. But basically the idea was there ought to be applied pieces to all degree programs, including Yale. <laughs> that it, it simply makes no sense in a world that's longing, as I said before, for us to send them more capacity to solve problems that students wouldn't have these kind of applied learning experiences that where they are solving problems of very specific kinds. So I'm by no means opposed to certificate programs or the many doors through which people come into higher education, my argument is whatever door they've come in, we have to have a notion of what the full house looks like. And we have to have creative ways of ensuring that they aren't just getting a short-term training, uh, but they are being prepared for those fast adapting jobs. And the fact that uh, we hear the same complaint that Mark mentioned before, well, their, their frontline recruiters are not um, looking for these liberal arts capacities. They just want to know whether or not they have a certain skill set for which they're hiring. But their evaluation and promotion systems look exactly at these things. Whether or not they'll be kept, whether or not they can, they can persist in their careers, whether they can be, have more than entry level jobs, all dependent on the full menu, not just on the applied learning. I wanted to ask both of you also um, to wade into an issue that got President Obama in a little trouble. Um, what, would, what kind of advice would you give to a son or daughter who said he or she really wanted to major in, say, art history at an expensive mm, private field. college? Um, and would it matter if the person, your child, had just a passionate interest in the subject? Um, so I, I'll tell a personal story. Um, and I don't think my daughter, I, I think she's forgiven me for this. 
so, uh, so one of the, I have two daughters, um, and both of them went to uh, Wesleyan, a liberal arts, uh, a, a, a very expensive liberal arts uh, uh, degree program, uh, school. Uh, so again, I'm displaying, I, I'm not, in, uh, you know, I don't have an antipathy towards liberal arts education. I wanted them to have a liberal arts education, and, and I was able to send them there. Um, but, so I had, I had two, two things that happened. The first one is I said, uh, you know, if you want to get a professional degree, because as even Carol's data shows, most liberal arts students end up with, uh, with professional degrees and that's where they make their money. You don't, you don't do so well with just a bachelor's degree in the liberal arts field. So, um, so I, the, the two pieces of advice I had to answer your question directly was, the first one is you can't go directly into graduate school or professional school after, after graduation. You have to do something else. So one of my daughters, uh, was th the, the daughter I'll tell the story about, uh, spent three years working for not-for-profits in Washington, D.C. I don't know why every liberal arts graduate in the, in, from a, a you know, highly paid institution thinks that the only places to work are not-for-profit organizations. I mean, this is, there's something crazy about this, but that's a different story. So uh, after three years, after three <laughs> years, my daughter, uh, my daughter said, I'm going to go to, time for me to go to graduate school. And I said, okay, what do you want? And she said, I want a PhD in medieval Spanish literature. Yeah, exactly, right. Um, so I, I said, well, that's very interesting. Why don't you just tell me you want me to buy you like the most expensive Mercedes in the world and I'll buy that for you because you know, it's a much more valuable consumer good than getting a PhD in, in medieval Spanish literature. And she, thought, she looked at me like I was crazy and I said, no, I'm really quite serious about this. I would just, I'd rather buy you a, a really fancy car than pay for a PhD where you're going to end up uh, you know, teaching in, uh, you know, in, in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I, I brought her to my office and I had arranged a call uh, you know, with a bunch of deans that I knew in, in, in arts and sciences and humanities and the, and the conversations always went like this. Um, the, I'm going to put you on the phone with my daughter Johanna and she wants a PhD in medieval Spanish literature and what do you think her employment prospects will be uh, after she gets it? And you know, after about three minutes of laughter, uh, they said zero, right? And maybe one, maybe two. So after three of these, I had lined up five of them, and after three of them, my daughter said, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. I said, I'm sorry, you got to do the, the next two. So, uh, so we, did the, uh, we did the next two, and at the end of which she said, I got it, I understand. And I said, here's the deal. So this goes back to, I mean, this is my guidance. I said, get into a top 10 law school and I'll pay for it. So she got into UVA and went to UVA, and I, and I paid for it. But if she wanted, I, I would not have given her a dime to get, even though she, this was her passion. So she became a passionate lawyer, and she and 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 uh, for many many years she did fine. And as I said, you know, the economy fell apart, and I'm supporting her a little bit. But uh, uh, but anyway, but um, but I I mean I believe that people have to follow their passions, but they have to know what the cost of following that passion is. Carol, what about you? Well, I'm sitting here thinking several things. One of which is that my own focus as an undergraduate was late medieval studies. <laughs> 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 and I'm remembering how upset my father was, <laughs> convinced that unless I could find someone to marry me, I had no economic future <laughs> whatsoever. Um, I'm also thinking that, uh, how many of you have had a chance to look at our report on the, uh, how arts and sciences graduates fare in the economy? It's, it's in your, your packet. Uh, I'm thinking that one of the co-authors of that, Deborah Humphreys, who worked with people at NSHEMS, which is a statistics-minded uh, research center. Um, Deborah Humphreys did her undergraduate degree in art history at Williams um, and has moved into a very high level, very influential job in communications uh, with AACNU. She has a PhD as well. Um, so these are some thoughts that are going through my mind, but I think the basic, the basic issue is this. Um, students absolutely deserve guidance um, on the like on the career span on the salary span of fields they're interested in, we should you're putting this information together. You have a lot of information. People should see it, uh, but they also need to, and they also need to know. And here is where I do take issue with things. Several things you've said this morning. It is not the case that people who majored in one of the humanities or social sciences or even the arts uh, are, can look forward to lifetimes in their families' basements. What our survey showed, we used, uh, the, this is the NCHEMS uh, sur survey data, 
We used 3 million um, items from the American Community Survey, which is collected by the uh, census. So you're, and they ask in that survey, what did you major in? What are you doing? What do you make? Did you go to graduate school? So we don't know what they went to graduate school in, but you can see the difference between no further graduate education and having, having done a graduate education. And it is absolutely true that if you don't go on to graduate school, the humanities, the people who majored in the humanities, social sciences, arts, will always be somewhat behind the others and way behind, everybody's way behind engineering. Engineering is in a zone by itself when it comes to salaries. If money is your primary purpose, do major in one of the engineering fields, uh, on some of the technical fields as well. But the other fields are not that far apart from each other all across the career span. So the difference between, let's say, going into science without a few further higher education, post-secondary education, and going into the humanities, with that the same, is probably going to be eight to $10,000 a year when you're in your 50s. Is this the basis on which to make your life choices? Well, that's a question each person has to answer for themselves. Some people would think, yes, that's a lot of money to leave on the table over a lifetime, and others would think, no, I really want to do uh, the work that I'm choosing through this major. The other thing that's really important for all of you to know about liberal, liberal arts majors is that they have a far broader set of career destinations than anybody else. So if you look at the top four destinations for people who majored in the humanities or social sciences or arts, the top field for them is elementary and middle school education, mm -hmm. which isn't well paid and it's not your fault that it's not well paid. We should never be evaluated by what your school teachers are making. Uh, that is a societal judgment, not your judgment. This, but the second one are people in legal fields. And they're very highly paid, and they're bringing up the average for the group. There's no question about it. The third is post-secondary educators, uh, too many of whom are now adjuncts, uh, not being well paid by us. Uh, and the fourth is uh, top-level um, management of various kinds and companies. So those are a very broad array of career destinations. Some the liberal arts uh, majors are twice as likely as people in other fields to choose socially vital careers that don't pay well, twice as likely. So we are building a sense of responsibility to the civic fabric of our society with those majors, but we're also not necessarily paying well as a society for those kinds of fields. People need to know this, but it shouldn't be determinative unless the student chooses to make it so. Right, and, and, and I agree, and, and as I said earlier, you know, one of the choices that we have to make is whether or not this is used for accountability or consumer information, and I, I mean, I'm in the consumer information business, I want people to understand what, uh, what their choices are. So I, I, I'm a little worried about this, uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how you phrase it, socially valuable, socially... Socially vital. Socially vital. I mean, we can't do without teachers. I we can't that. do without social workers. But we also we really can't... do need our not-for-profits, even though we don't pay as well as as uh, IBM, um, we need all these things for the, the, the fabric of our communities. But we also need for-profits. We also need wealth generators. Absolutely. We also need, Absolutely. you know, we, we, inventions come out of, of for-profit companies. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit worried when we start doing these kinds of dichotomies between socially viable or socially valuable, um, and, and somehow that's the not-for-profit world, and then we denigrate the, the, the person who's actually building something or on the, on, you know, building, putting together a wing for Boeing. I mean, those are, that, that's socially valuable. Too. I don't think I've said anything that denigrates that. I believe I spent a lot of time saying that um, this is what employers from the for-profit side largely are looking for, and these are the ways in which what they're doing is building a future for our society, for our economy, and for individual careers. Um, I wonder if we might be able to open it up if okay. any of you have questions. Um, I'd like to give you an opportunity to uh, ask our panelists. Or if any of you would like to weigh in on some of these issues. Commissioner? Uh, let me uh, suggest for, let me suggest for a moment that uh, we can, we can reach a compromise between these two positions and say that we recognize that liberal education is very valuable, that, that, uh, uh, but that students need to have marketable skills in whatever discipline they major in. Yeah, what, what I find to be the obstacle is 
we don't know how to do that. In the humanities, uh, in some of the social sciences, we don't know how to teach students marketable skills. So my question to you is, how do we do that? For example, what are the, the pedagogies, what are, what are the curricular strategies that give students in art history and philosophy and political science marketable skills. Now the very bright students will figure that out and those are the ones that become CEOs of, uh, of large corporations. But a lot of students really don't know how to market, market themselves and I think institutions bear responsibility for that. How do we teach marketable skills across the range of uh, programs that uh, you find in universities? Well, I'll jump in on that. Um, how are the acoustics? Can you hear all this? Yeah, okay. Um, the suggestions I made at the end about getting students involved in some sort of signature work was, a, a, you could have called it a marketable skills work, I suppose, because it's the idea of getting students significantly involved in working with a complex issue and doing so in a practical way, not just an analytical way or an academic way, but a practical way. So let me uh, flesh this out by just uh, describing something that's going on in my own undergraduate uh, alma mater, which was a liberal arts college, Mount Holyoke College. When I was there, believe me, the only career they were concerned about was getting you into graduate school. Um, and after that, you were pretty much on your own. But today, um, students are, every student is being expected to have a paid internship, and the college is helping with that. Uh, and every student is expected to connect a set of courses to that internship. So in effect, the college is saying, get interested in a career tr track, find some courses here, or in this particular case, they can take courses at University of Massachusetts Amherst or Amherst or Smith as well, because they have interactions. Um, so you take the, take the courses, but you also have the practical experience, and many students are then uh, encouraged to do a research project as a senior that builds on all that. So it's the practical, and, and I've, I've heard trustees at my uh, much better paid trustees than I at, at that college when I was on its board say, we don't need an economics major to hire you on Wall Street. But we do need to see that you've had some experience working with finance. So you need some economics courses, whatever you majored in. You need some financial experience, whatever you majored in. And I think that more general point is put together a portfolio that shows you've had experiences, that you've had a deep dive into some real issues, uh, and all of this is building your capacity to be marketable. So I, I think actually we have sort of a, um, a, a guidance about what kind of skills are, are valued, right? So, um, so again, I'll use my, my own daughters um, who wanted, you know, philosophy majors and things like that. Uh, one was, God forbid, I mean, I was a political science major. But I said, um, I said look, you, you major in anything you want. And, this, and, and actually, Carol and I are on the same pages. But you have to take statistics, you have to take computers, you have to take programming, you have to take statistics, you have to take statistics, you have to take math, <laughs> right? And, 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 they came out, uh, and they came out with a bunch of actual usable problem-solving skills. So I, I, I don't care. I mean, you know, so they, they, you know, I could argue with them about what political theory or whatever, but ultimately I said, fine, do that, you know, but you, you need these sets of concrete skills. So I think when I look at my data, right, and I, and, and again, I mean, this is, a, you know, this is my, uh, maybe a prejudice from hanging around universities for most of my life. I think that one of the things that we've done is that in things like, uh, you know, crit lit and, 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 and a lot of these kinds of very specialized study programs is that we are not attending to skills that students need or that, and we're not delivering those skills, right? I mean, you, the, you know, the, the ability to uh, parse Proust is not something that's going to be marketable in, in the real world. So I believe that we do have, we do need to, to, to go back to, you know, statistics, statistics, statistics. That's, you know, that's what, that, that's, that, that, that's what's, a, a, you know, a very valuable skill. And if we look at math majors, they get, they, they have a huge bonus, right? They're under engineers, but way above almost any other graduate in terms of the, their, their wages. And why is that? Because they actually have concrete problem solving skills that can be applied to lots and lots of different, uh, uh, different problems, including Wall Street. Any other questions? We have one There's over here. Hi. 
Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to bore anybody with all of this history business, but I do. I did study the purposes of liberal education in the Renaissance, and I can tell you that in the 15th century, the purpose of a liberal education was leadership for an elite. That is what the liberal education evolved as in the 14th and 15th century in Italy. Okay, so that's a very narrow purpose. And it was really only studied by people who were gonna control other people, people who were gonna dominate society, right? So when you say that there are no leadership skill or that there, is no, there are no skills to history or literature or philosophy, I think a Renaissance Italian would say the point is a precisely to be able to imagine other people's perspectives, right? You study literature, you study history, so that you can um, see the world in a 360 degrees, simply to take control. And not just to control politically, but to control any aspect of any human endeavor you want to engage in, you have got to persuade people. You have got to talk them into your point of view. If you know what you want to do, you are not going to be able to be convincing without those liberal arts on your side. In today's world, you can't do branding without it. You can't do uh, negotiations without it. There are a million things you cannot do. Uh, well, there are a million things that require the imagination that the liberal arts give you. So, I guess I'm, I'll stop talking very quickly, but what it scares me is that when you say that these don't provide any skills, what, you, what I hear is that these are only skills that some people should have, right? The leaders, otherwise known as a ruling elite. And I think it's beneficial, and I, I really like this idea of civic engagement, to think of all of our students as potential leaders, whether they're going to be plant managers, or human resources people, or social workers, or fix shrimp boats and manage a team. I'm from Beaumont, by the way, where they fix a lot of shrimp boats. But it doesn't matter. Leadership is the skill. Leadership matters whatever endeavor you're in. And I would hate for that to only be available to the people who can afford it and, and not for everyone else. So, thank you. I have another question over here. Thank you very much for your comments. <clears throat> okay, I, I just wanna add that in education, yeah. we sometimes focus and then we not focus. We used to have a cliche called lifelong learner. I actually drank the Kool-Aid. I am a lifelong learner. And this is something that perhaps when we talk about marketable skills cert uh, certificates and marketable skills, students are not really understanding our language. But if we sometimes look at curriculum and maybe invert general education to a junior and senior level, and have the skills early on, we can hook them and say, you are going to be a lifelong learner. You're becoming a techie now, a data scientist with your statistics. But you know, perhaps later, as a lifelong learner, you can come to a symposium and read about Renaissance history. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So we need to look at curriculum. It is stale, very stale. And some of our degree plans perhaps need to have an inverted pyramid and have general education for the innovation, critical thinking later, and then hook them with the, um, and here I'm using hook them because we're at UT, I don't know, <laughs> um, early. That's lifelong learning. We have to get focus on that because we lost that focus. We're using now other words. But lifelong learning is a good one with information available to us. We're drowning in data. We need to mine it. We need to study it. Um, so I would like the academy to look at curriculum. Uh, we kicked Latin out a hundred years ago. That's the last time we looked at it. So we need to get back and kind of clean it up and invert the pyramid, get them going. 
That's my two bits. Thank you very <laughs> thank you. much. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Enjoyed the discussion. I think we're out of time, but let's thank our panelists. Thank you so much.